Hey, I'm Kirk Harnack. On This Week in Radio Tech, we've got Chris Tarr, Chris Tobin, and our special guest, Bill Harlan. Bill's going to give us a tour of the ERI factory and tell us about how you put two big honking signals together and do it efficiently. It's on This Week in Radio Tech, coming up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is This Week in Radio Tech, episode 129, recorded May 16th, 2012. Bill Harlan. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Axia Audio and the IQ IP Audio Console. On the web at axiaaudio.com slash IQ. Hi there, it's time for This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host for the show. I'm just delighted to be here. I'm a broadcast engineer from, from way back when. See this gray hair? I got most of it fixing transmitters. And uh, I, uh, Kirk, I, I ran a, uh, a broadcast uh, uh, contract engineering firm for quite a few years. I was uh, on the air on some radio stations um, in uh, in Kentucky and in Mississippi and Arkansas. Ran a broadcast engineering firm out of Memphis, Tennessee for some time. And, and now I work for the folks at Telos, but I'm still part owner of uh, some radio stations in Mississippi and American Samoa. So that's my qualifications or lack thereof. Just kind of been there, done that in small markets myself. Got a, got a guy who's one of our co-hosts, uh, regular co-hosts, and uh, that would be Chris Tobin. He's a big market guy from New York City. Hey, Chris Tobin, thanks for being with us. <laughs> Hello, Kirk. <clears throat> yes, New York City it is. Uh, my credentials, are, uh, pedigree, I guess you can call it. 20 plus years doing radio and some television there as well. And uh, now I'm a president at CCS Music Camp for disclosure, uh, disclosure for IP codex and audio and video domains. And I too have been a crazy radio guy running around in uh, small, medium and large markets and uh, enjoying the large market stuff has been fun. So I still, still do a lot of work with folks on a consulting basis. So I still slap my fingers in the mix. And uh, t Tom Ray is uh, is taking the night off, and that means that the only guy on the show who's actually getting his hands dirty on a daily basis <laughs> is our friend from Muckwanago, Wisconsin, Chris Tarr. Hey, Chris, how are you? See, I even I even have the you know the scrapes on my hand. I can't can't see it now. Scrapes on my hand to prove it. So, uh, yes, I'm uh, director of engineering for Intercom's radio stations in Madison and Milwaukee, uh, Wisconsin. Still out there every day, beating on transmitters and. Uh, cranking on phaser cabinets and all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, I also uh, do a lot of uh, contract engineering consulting for stations around the area, uh, contributing writer to Radio Guide magazine, and uh, co-founder of broadcastengineering.info. we got to be sure we mention that website uh, before the show's over again. Remind folks to go there at broadcastengineering.info, right? Correct. Okay. The more we say it, the, the, maybe the more people will go. I remember every now and then. Hey, and we've got a guest on the show on This Week in Radio Tech. I love when we have guests because we get to talk to somebody who knows something that we don't. <laughs> and uh, our guest is a fellow that we talked to at this last NAB show. I was just delighted to, uh, to meet up with Bill Harland of ERI, Electronics Research Incorporated. Hello there, Bill Harland. How are you? Thanks for having me on. Have a good evening. Uh Bill, you're you're involved with the marketing department at ERI, but you also have enough of a technical background to uh, know what you're talking about, right? Well, that's uh, that's that's actually the case. Uh, I've been with ERI for about ten years, and before that, I was with Andrews Broadcast uh, Products Group, and before that, Broadcast Electronics, and worked for Harris for a while. So uh, I've been pushing transmitters and antennas around for quite some time. Well, on uh, on this show, we're going to talk about a few little topical things here at first, as, as we often do. But we're going to get around to getting, I guess, a little tour of some of the ERI manufacturing facilities. I think you've got some pictures to share with us. And uh, then we're also going to hear something that I was just Im taken by at the NAB show, and that is this combiner that combines uh, a station's FM signal and a station's HD transmitter and does so in such a way that you're not losing 90% of the power from the HD transmitter in the form of heat. And uh, I, this is just a, a terrific thing, especially for stations that are able to raise their HD power. 
Um, so uh, this it's a real boon for for radio stations from the out of the transmitter site from the technical point of view. Allows them to get more power out or save some money or do both. And I think you've got some great pictures and a diagram too of. Uh, of, of that system. So, Bill, thanks for joining us. If you'll, uh, you could welcome to jump in any time here. We're going to hit a couple of topical things, and then we're going to jump right into the the topic uh, at, at hand. Hey, uh, guys, uh, last week we had on our show John Poire uh, talking about uh, engineers and the the aging of broadcast engineers. And hey, where are the new ones coming from? Do we need them? Is there going to be a shortage or not? And uh, interestingly, uh, our good friend Mark Persons uh, has uh, written an article in Radio World with the same subject. Uh, his title of his article is Where Have All the Engineers Gone? And um, uh, not, nothing so surprising uh, that he's saying in here. Um, uh, but I, I was kind of interested in one thing from the uh, the article in Radio World. This is from RW, uh, from RadioWorld.com. We can also go to RWOnline.com. Um he, uh, he said that recently, this is Mark Person speaking, he said recently I was at a cell site that's co-located with an FM uh, broadcast transmitter. I was having trouble with my soldering iron. And I asked the cell site repairman, happened to be there at the same time, if I, if I could borrow his iron. And he said, oh, we don't have soldering irons anymore because nothing we work on requires soldering. So I was just kind of curious about about soldering irons. I was actually using one a couple of days ago. I had to I had to put a, a PL two fifty nine connector on each end of this coax uh, for my my new uh, ham radio. Uh, Chris Tar, do you use a soldering iron very often? <laughs> All the time. I have about four or five of them. Actually, a funny story. Uh, last week, I was with my uh, engineer from Madison, Tony, and we were uh, working on some stuff, and I wanted to change out a connector. And he said, oh, you know what? I don't think uh, I don't think I've got a soldering iron. I said, hang on. <laughs> Went out to my trunk where I keep my soldering iron, pulled it out. We were all set to go. So, yeah, I probably have four or five soldering irons and almost always have one with me. So you just you never know when you're going to need it. Do you, I was always enamored with those these either the battery powered ones uh, or the, the little butane gas soldering irons. Do you have one of those? Yeah, actually, I use the butane one a whole lot. That's really handy to have. They heat up really quickly. And obviously, you can get in there and, and uh, you know, in a tight spaces with it without worrying about cords. You know, the the one thing I wanted to mention is we're talking about soldering irons. I say, you know, I, I hear a lot of times people go, oh, I, I, you know, I can't solder real well, you know, very well, or, you know, it's really hard to do. And I have found that, and, and this was another, you know, a guy who mentored me, who, you know, really said, you know, you've got to spend some money and get a decent soldering iron. It's the difference between driving a Pinto and driving a Cadillac. And he's right. I mean, I, I actually went out and spent the money on a decent Weller. Even my butane one's a Weller uh, soldering iron. And, you know, I, it, soldering became exceptionally easy after that. You know, it just it really does. The, 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 the quality of the soldering iron makes all the difference in the world. And the other thing I would add is the right tip for the job, you know, chisel tip or the pencil tip or whatever. But, you know, if you're going to be doing some soldering, don't buy a $5 soldering iron over at the hobby store. Really get... You know, spend some money. It doesn't have to be a lot. Thirty, forty dollars will get you a very high quality portable soldering iron, and life will be a lot easier. <laughs> Trust me on this one. <laughs> Chris Tobin in New York City. Were you, were you guys solderless, or did you actually pick up an iron from time to time? Oh no, no, soldering irons were definitely in use. Uh, we kept several on the bench and at the transmitter rooms. Uh, we had one, two, three, at least four. Yeah, you could definitely find them. Um, because of certain fire codes, we cannot use the uh, butane ones, but. Uh, we found ways to make the electric ones work just fine in those tight spaces. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's amazing. The codes keep you from, from doing your job well. Because I, I love those butane things. They, you, you, in, indeed, you, if you were up in some place that's hard to get a cord to, uh, it sure could be valuable. Especially if you're like up on a tower and you had to solder something maybe in a strobe light controller. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll say this, that there are... They've been in, put in use. It's just they're not officially found anywhere. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> because <laughs> bear in mind, uh, bear in mind, some of the transmitter facilities that I've worked in, uh, the smoke detecting systems are part of a larger building, and uh, uh, those larger buildings yeah. have connections to the fire department, and uh, you, yeah. you just don't want to, you know, set off that Class C alarm, you know, for no reason. <laughs> uh, yeah, those, I've, I've, I, I love. I mean, those butane ones. I love those. I mean, they fire right up. You, you know, literally within sixty seconds or so, you're ready to rock. So they're, they're, you know, they're fantastic for those quick, you know, very quick little. I just got to solder this real quick and, and move on type of jobs. Uh, also, you know, I, if you have a bench, invest in a variable temp. Uh, soldering iron again. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, uh, Weller actually, you know, has a really good package where it's got a uh, you know portable tip 
uh, soldering iron that just plugs into the base, which has the adjustable temperature control on it. So you kind of get a two for one that way. But a soldering station as well with the variable temperature is something else I, I highly recommend. And, and again, all of a sudden soldering becomes real easy to do when you have the right stuff. I've, I've always found that the best soldering occurs when you when the tip of the soldering iron is clean. I mean, just slick, silvery, very clean. And a, a, am I a bad boy for always cleaning the tip of my soldering iron on my jeans? Because that sure works. <laughs> it works. That, that, that works really well. I do that. I've got you know I do have a uh, tinner, and I, I you know another thing I always recommend is and unfortunately it. it you know, tends to kill your your tips fairly quickly, but using the uh, the sponge that they give you to uh, you know to keep the the tip clean and and uh, nice and shiny when you're doing your work that helps as well. But yeah, either you know quick quick uh, wipe on the pants or a fling down on the floor to get it cleaned out, and you're you're ready to go for another round. <laughs> I'm, oh wow! Hey, I'm gonna ask Bill Harlan. I I'm, I'm thinking about ERI. See, and ERI makes. Big stuff. Now, maybe they make some little stuff too that I'm not thinking of right now. But I got to think. You know, what's the what's the smallest soldering iron at ERI? You know, fifty thousand uh, BTUs. <laughs> Have you seen a, B, uh, a soldering no, iron out in the shop, Bill? That's no. We don't use soldering irons. Uh, everything here is pretty much done with silver solder. So uh, every a lot of torches, a lot of butane, and of course, uh, most of what we do is weld. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. In fact, I got to ask about about that that welding. That's uh, that's going to be pretty interesting. Especially, uh, you know, ERI makes these beautiful FM antennas, and most folks in broadcast, uh, at least at stations the size that I worked at, uh, are familiar with the ERI, the famous rototiller design. And those things are just so beautifully put together, uh, and and so weather, um, I guess, resistant. Uh, I just I just love the way that they were put together. So, such a nice design, and the and the the welding or brazing, and I I don't know the right words. But the way they're put together just looked so good. So uh, we'll be asking Bill about that. So, okay, enough about, enough about soldering irons. Hey, did you know that today, May 16th, is uh, Salute a High School Radio Station Day? Or it's High School Radio Day. So it's the day to, to salute them. Um, apparently, according to an article in uh, RW Online, Pete Bowers is a station manager at uh, WBFHFM in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. Uh, he pushed the concept about having a high school radio day. He chose May as the month to do it uh, because the first U.S. high school uh, radio station was WNAS. That went on the air in May of 1949. Uh, apparently, there are only about 200 high school radio stations in the U.S. By the way, that includes those stations that act, don't actually transmit, but they're just uh, they're internet only uh, streaming operations. And uh, and he says that that number is dropping. That's kind of hard to believe, but uh, I would think that stations would get into you know. A, a having a, a a studio and and, and streaming, uh, Chris uh, or Chris, you guys know anything about radio high school radio stations and you know how what part they play in uh, in in promoting our business? Uh, well, I can well, say I, that. I, I uh, do know. Oh, good. Oh, no, go ahead. Did I cut somebody off. All right, fair enough. I'll go. Um, I participate each year with the IBS folks, the Intercollegiate Broadcasting System, here in New mm -hmm. York City. They have their um, annual convention. Uh, folks from all across the country come in from high schools, colleges, uh, non-coms, the whole bit. And I do know, talking with some of them on a couple of panels, a lot of the high school radio stations that are, are you know disappearing, a lot of it is because of a lack of interest. Some of it is funding. Uh, and and um, those are the two biggies. And the other one is just the difficulty of maintaining the licenses because of the inexperienced people that happen to be fortunate enough to get them. And didn't realize yeah. what was involved and didn't realize that the license had expired some time ago. And then some FCC uh, person decided to come by and uh, you know, enforce the rule. So that's part of the reasoning. But I think a lot of it probably is the, the way times have changed. And, uh, you know, broadcast industry is, doesn't have the same you know, luster it had in the past because of the you know, consolidation and changes in programming and, and imaging. I think too. You you know you mentioned you know keeping the license. Uh, you know there used to be the ten watt educational license that were you know pretty easy to get for for schools, and those have been long gone. And you know those who have them are grandfathered. But even those, if people forget to renew them or things like that, they go away. And it's a lot harder now because you actually have to license as a class A, and and in a non com band you have to kind of wedge it in. And typically the minute you go away, you know somebody else jumps in and tries to claim the frequency. So that you know there there's some engineering issues too. Is you know it used to be very easy to get uh, one of those ten watt licenses for your high school, 
And since those aren't available anymore, uh, you know, they're talking about the LP service, uh, possibly, you know, LPFM kind of, you know, filling in that void a little bit. But I think that was the big one was it was either upgrade or go away. And if you didn't upgrade, you know, we have a, a 10 watt here that it's just basically been encroached from all sides with other stations on the same frequency. And, and you know, you can uh. barely pick it up anymore. But I had a lot of fun. I actually did some work for uh, for a high school station back uh, late '80s, early '90s, and uh, that was that was a good time. I you know, it was it was a lot of fun, and the kids back then were still interested in it. I just wonder, does a high school station uh, can it can it serve a purpose? Because back in the day, back in the in the late '70s um, uh, and all through the '80s, I suppose I was involved in doing occasional work for high school stations. You know, fixing something, fixing a console or or a transmitter, and you know that was back before we had Winamp and back before we had the internet and back before we had iPods, back before anybody could make their own music programming, if that's what you want to make. And these high school stations that I was familiar with, typically, uh, they did a little bit of talk, but it was mostly spinning records or, you know, punching a button on, you know, next, next, next on an automation system. And uh, I, I just want, you know, is, is there real value in that? I'm, I'm not so sure that there is. Now, if a high school station wants to encourage uh, kids to, to speak, to talk, to have, have, you know, put together a newscast, put together uh, news stories or vignettes or, or radio dramas, I think there's value in that. But, it's, you know, I can't see any value in just learning how to spin a record or hit next on the automation. No, I agree, and and I and and I think that's the other thing is is the lack of programs for some of these these school stations. And I've also seen you know in some states where public radio takes over and runs a lot of the programming on these student stations too, because they're looking for outlets and it's cheap programming and it's easy to do and things like that. So you know it it is. It's kind of I think there's just a perfect storm of things that has kind of made you know high school uh, uh, even even college radio to some extent uh, kind of a, a disappearing. A vanishing entity because of you know lack of interest and and difficulty in maintaining licenses and and things like that. Remember what um, uh, Chuck Kelly, who has uh, been a guest on on this show a, a, a time or two, told us about um, a non commercial FM uh, up in uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia, where they program it. It's um, he wanted to refer it as push radio, and that, that may be a good term for it. Where basically different content creators, people in the community, uh, would create a show. And turn it into an MP3 file, and then upload that file to to a little FTP server, and it was really the automation system in in the transmitter, uh, and and they would just play that out. So you had the community programming without having to have a formal, you know, paying the rent studio location with offices and a phone system and furniture and all that kind of stuff that 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 even a minimal operation tends to have to have. So you had a virtual radio station that, that people would upload to. I mean, password protected and all that kind of stuff. That sounded like a pretty cool idea if you wanted to, to teach, you know, let people learn on their own or teach them how to create content and then let them hear the results of that on a, on a broadcast facility. Doesn't that sound like a good idea? Yeah, I think it's great. That would work. I think it, that would work, yeah. Fun. All right. Well, hey, uh, uh, let's see. I want to move on to one more thing. Oh, yeah. Chris, you mentioned that the 10 watt educational FMs that are grandfathered in, um, there is a question of whether or not the FCC should eliminate the LP10 class, the 10 watt LP FMs, different, I believe, than the 10 watt educationals that are, that are no longer, you know, have been not available for a long time. Um, so this debate is is, is going on. Do uh, you guys have any opinion or heard much about that? Yeah, I, I, I think um, I think it's a good idea. I mean, you look at the difference between 10 watts and 100 watts. You're not talking about a huge difference in coverage, but I think it's, mm -hmm. you know, I think the coverage is a little more reliable. And, you know, I, I think even 10 watts in a small area is, is difficult without the proper engineering. You know, if, if there's a, you know, I have worked with high school stations that are 10 watts that were designed well, you know, in the mid 70s or whatever, when they were still building these, they, that work fantastically well. But generally, not uh you know nowadays that that kind of experience or expertise isn't available so you know these little 10 watt lpfms you can barely hear them down the street so i you know i i think it's a good idea uh oh there's one one more topical item i want to ask you guys about uh the june 30th um eas cap deadline is approaching um gee i've got to talk to my business partner at our radio stations what do i need to have ready by june 30th Chris, I'm sure uh, Chris Tarr. I'm sure you've uh, been dealing with CAP EAS at your stations. Probably ready, aren't you? 
Oh, yeah. No, we've been ready since late last year. Uh, there's a couple of ways you can do it. Uh, I recommend getting an all-new, an entirely new EAS box, such as like the Sage Digital Index, uh, just because the new logging available in these boxes are fantastic. In fact, now I, I, I can do paperless logging now with EAS tests, which is great. So um, there's that, that's one way to do it. You can also get uh, the FCC has decided to allow uh, CAP add-ons, which is just basically uh, – uh, a single unit box with a network connection that can yeah. uh, translate cap codes into EAS and will work with existing EAS boxes. So there's a couple of ways to do it. Prices range anywhere from, uh, you know, if you just get the EA, the cap converter for EAS is about $1,300 all the way up to uh, $2,500 for a you know, full on replacement EAS box. Hmm. Well, we've got several locations to uh, to deal with, so um, uh, got got to talk, talk to my partner Larry about what we're, how we're gonna how we're gonna take care of that. He may already have have something in the works. Am, am I correct though in understanding that it, you've got to have a, a connection to the public internet at your facility in order f- to implement CAP EAS? Correct. You need some sort some sort some form of IP connectivity. Correct. Mm. And if you don't have that, that's just too bad. I mean, uh, you, 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 you have to make that you have to make that happen, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, you have to make that happen, and you know, it's it's getting easier and easier. I know I know it's going to be kind of difficult for some places, but if you've got internet coming into your into your studio, you should be able to make it work. Got gotcha. you, got gotcha. you. All right. Well, I'd be looking forward to going paperless, man. I I could just do without buying any more of those little rolls of uh, thermal paper. Yeah, That'd we be awesome. we. Uh, we we came up with a, a basically we can download the data from our digital end deck into a spreadsheet and then we already have cover pages already set i've got an electronic signature and so all i do is download every week the actually um, tony does my engineer downloads it every week i put my uh, my digital signal uh, signature on there it goes in with a digital public file and we're done so uh, it makes logging fa- really really easy although i have found one of the one of the drawbacks is the staff is used to hearing the, the, the motor on the printer go to know that there's no <laughs> print. You know, they listen yeah. to that, rah, 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 with the paper <laughs> comes out. And that's wrong. Yeah, so I, you know, I have an enunciator panel, and they have to watch for the flashing light now when, when an alert comes in. Uh, otherwise, they, they won't know what happened because there's no printer on them. Oh, uh, the problem's created by new technology. <laughs> hey, before I forget, I, there's, there, there's something I wanted to, to talk about real quick. Uh, sure. A new tool that I'm just all excited about. Okay. Uh, this is a brand new, uh, brand new thing. I just happened to find uh, a week ago, and I ordered one. It's made by Hosa Technology. H O S A T E C H is the website, and they're introducing the CBT 500 cable tester. Now, what gets me geeked out about this is it tests XLR, balanced and unbalanced phono, or phone rather, quarter inch phono, DIN, Ethernet, USB A to B. And also has test leads on it. And then it has on the front LEDs to show you make or break on the connections. And all of this in a portable box. And the price, the street price is, what is it? It's like $69.95 or $69.95 is the street price. If you call your vendor, like I did with mine, I got it for $50. Wow. And I, I mean, this thing tests every kind of cable under the sun. It's an ugly looking box because it's got jacks all the way around it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, but, I'm looking at a picture but, of it right now at the website. Right, but I mean, just uh, just imagine, you know, how many times you've went to go test a cable and you've got your, you know, your multimeter out with the probes trying to hold it straight while you jiggle to see if there's a short or a bad yes, connection. Yes, or, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, this thing tests all of that by just plugging it in and shows you lights up whether it's good or bad. And for, you know, if you go through your distributor, it's like 50 bucks. How do you not get something like that? I mean, that is fantastic. Yeah. Well, what I, what I want is a I don't on this Hosa I don't see an inch and five eighths connector on there, or or <laughs> three and an eight. That's what I that's what I want. And, well, that's a VSWR detector on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and and, and, a, and a and a TDM. I don't know TDR. TDR. Time to make TDR. a reflect And yeah. I want it all for fifty dollars. That yeah, that's right. So here's the guy that, that will tell us it's not anywhere near fifty dollars. I, I, I want to formally bring into the into the show here and and uh, and start talking to our guest, uh, Bill Harland at ERI Electronics Research Incorporated. Bill, uh, hey, listen, thanks for holding on through our uh, topical hey. discussion. Appreciate you being here. And um, hey, one uh, of the things I did in college was make my class D a class A. How'd you do that? Uh, filed a construction permit, did a power increase, bought a transmitter. That's why Harris 
gave me a job eventually. I bought a Harris ah. transmitter. <laughs> ah. But that so, was 1976. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, at ERI, you've got some you have, you have some pictures you want to go ahead and share with us, and I, I think that'd be a great idea to, to get a little a, yeah, a little tour just, of the place. Right. Why don't we just take them uh, in whatever order they uh, they appear? Why don't we put up the first one? And here comes Burke with the first picture. Here he is. Here he comes. Yes. There we go. Oh, well, this is a, a layout of uh, an aerial photo that uh, highlights some of the areas. We've got here in uh, Chandler, Indiana, which is right outside Evansville, where uh, we're headquartered. We've got about 100 acres at this particular location, a uh, little over 200,000 square feet under under roof. Uh, building there on the left uh, is the main manufacturing facility and offices uh, besides the office and laboratory space, uh, drafting is located in here. And this is where actually the rototillers are built. And, uh, so, uh, on the, uh, that would be the, uh, Northeast corner there in the, uh, uh, in the lower right building. That's also where the structural, uh, products are constructed, the towers. And then uh, what we call the south building, which is immediately out and back there, is uh, where we've got a burn table. That burn table uh, is capable of uh, cutting, say, a leg flange out of a four-inch thick piece of steel. And, uh, a little, oh. Uh, yo, it's just great. Gee. It's a nice machine. It could hurt you. <laughs> and uh, we also do the painting out there. And uh, along the back there, uh, there's uh, a raised deck where we actually tune the uh, rototiller and uh, FM panel antennas. Uh, we've got a small test range out and back. Uh, the center building is uh, where we do purchasing and logistics. Uh, next to that is uh, rigid line fabrication. And then all the way over there on the right, there are two buildings. Those buildings are actually not metal. They're fiberglass hmm. uh, on the building to the uh, that's shown uh, to the north, uh, the top one. That's what we call the Tracer building. And in there is where we actually tune uh, the UHF and VHF television antennas at buildings uh, 120 feet deep and roughly 65 feet across. And the building next to it is what we call the acquired uh, Andrews Broadcast Antenna Business. We took that building down uh, at the Andrew facility outside of Chicago and actually moved it down here. And uh, so that's uh, pretty much the facility. We do take whatever slide comes up next. And uh, got a few here that show around. That's a, just oh, a yeah. picture of the campus. I'm and really interested in, in this site here. Yeah, this is amazing, this uh, test uh, test range. Right. We have a full-scale test range. Uh, it's one of the largest in the country uh, that's dedicated to FM broadcast use. We've got 70 acres here. It's roughly uh, five, six miles from the plant. We've got two turntables, uh, uh, one on the north. This this is oriented uh, so that uh, the uh, – well, they – the center turntable there is our main turntable. Uh, we can spin towers up to, uh, oh, roughly 14 feet across and 40 feet tall. And then uh, to the uh, south there, this, this picture is oriented with north uh, to the top of the frame. Uh, then there's a second turntable that's uh, shown there to the south. We also have a static stand there. Uh, the buildings there give us some small machine shop capability because they actually do fabricate full-scale models. Uh, we really believe that, uh, particularly at FM frequency, it, you can do chamber testing at UHF because things are small enough. But when you get down right. to FM, you really have to do things at full scale because when you scale something down to one-fourth its size, hmm. you don't need to tweak things very far uh, at, Having something bent uh, half an inch out of, out of the way when you scale that up four times, that can really turn into something. Let's, now, let, let's uh, hey Bill, if you don't mind, let, let's go yeah. back to that picture that that we were showing there just a second, Burke, and and let's describe what happens at an antenna test range, um, and, and why. I mean, a, a customer, I guess, uh, uh, is uh, an FM station has a license, a construction permit, and they're going to put up a, maybe a new tower or maybe put a new antenna on an older tower. And let's say that this station, for all kinds of reasons, that this tower has to be 20 miles out of town. 
It's not right in the middle of, of some city of financial interest or maybe the city of license. Uh, or maybe it's, uh, as so often is the case, the tower is somewhere between the city of license and what I would call the city of financial interest. And we want to, I guess, um, uh, either we want to optimize the circularity or, you know, the, the azimuthal circul circularity of the pattern, or we want to kind of try to make sure that the, the pattern is going to favor one direction over another. Or another case is where the license calls for you to use a directional FM antenna. And so you guys have to certify and show that this antenna, when mounted properly, will, you know, protect this azimuth or that azimuth uh, where another station would exist from from too much power from this antenna. So I, I get, I've described a couple of scenarios. Uh, are there others? Or if I kind of describe why people need to get this tested? You've covered the primary reasons people pay for for either scale or full scale testing. In the case of a directional antenna, uh, you you are you are required to have a proof of performance that can be done at full scale or at partial scale. Uh, both are acceptable to the commission for the reasons I've stated. Uh, ERI really believes that you've got to do that full scale to get uh, an accurate representation, and that's. Uh, the ERI Lambda frequency op frequency matched tower sections. Uh, those are primary application is in di as direction support structures for directional antennas, because as a practical matter, you can't spin and test a 120 foot long 12 bay directional FM antenna. You usually just spin two or four bays of that mm. antenna. Mm. And the thing with a lambda section is it's built to frequency. So all of the structure that supports that antenna through the array is identical behind each element. So if you test two bays and then you stack eight bays for the actual finished antenna. If you use a lambda section, then you know that each section of that antenna is replicated faithfully, and uh, the, the signal is radiated from all eight elements in the same fashion because they're reflected from the structure the same. Now, it's important in a non-directional facility to understand that when the commission talks about not only for radio but for television, when we talk about non-directional facilities on a side-mounted antenna, the commission considers that the structure has no impact. <laughs> but the reality is the structure yeah. does have an impact. Yeah. And uh, not only do we look at uh, optimizing signal or taking advantage of uh, tower reflection. But the more important thing that uh, we often do with pattern optimization and why you often see directors on an antenna that is not a directional is the vertically polarized component and the horizontally polar polarized component reflect differently. Oh, yeah. And so a lot of, yeah, so a lot of times it's very important that you ha make sure you try and have the same amount of vertically polarized and horizontally polarized signal consistently throughout your desired coverage area. Because if you have a lot of V-pole and no H-pole in one area, you're going to have spaces where you're not going to have, where your just signal is going to go away. Right, right. Okay. All right. Uh, and we're at the moment, we've been spending our time talking about the very traditional design of an ERI rototiller design. You guys, uh, as, as other companies do, you, you make panel antennas. Can you uh, spend a minute talking about, about panel antennas and their uh, design construction or how you specify a panel antenna? Well, typically when we look at a panel antenna, uh, the uh, – the situation is that it's either top mounted or your uh you have a desire for an omnidirectional pattern on a very wide large face tower mm. and you typically want to accommodate you can multiplex into a side mounted rototiller two three or four signals without any issue at all uh, okay. when you get into five six or more signals of uh, you uh i'm thinking <coughs> My my aunt, or senior road in Houston, you've got uh, ten. Uh, the American Tower site, Miami, uh, eleven FM facilities and a common uh, panel antenna. Uh, it's uh, you can also do directional patterns with multiple frequencies uh, using a panel antenna. And a few things. One thing we've done off and on. Uh, is uh, we'll build a panel system that'll have, say, one station as a directional and everybody else is omnidirectional. So there are a lot of interesting things you can do with panel antennas. But the real thing is 
Uh, most often, it's multiple stations, solid omnidirectional coverage in a situation where they can't be top mounted, and lots of power. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I suppose uh, at at um, uh, at Empire State Building in in New York is is that is, is there a panel antenna there for the FMs? Yeah, uh, there actually uh, ERI has three different panel antennas on that facility. Hmm. Uh, the first one, of course, was put up in the early nineties. Uh, it now has uh, seventeen radio stations on it. Oh my goodness! Uh, it's a, yeah, it's a two layer four around uh, panel antenna, and then immediately below that. There's uh, the replacement for, uh, I believe it was an Alfred antenna, for the legacy facilities on the Empire State Building. Uh, that would be WCBS and uh, WQHT and WPLJ. WKRC also has a port in that. That's also a uh, separate antenna, uh, digital antenna for two of the stations that are on the um, main master antenna. And then there's also at another location a, a two-bay, four-run master antenna which serves as a backup for that uh, uh, single layer uh, for on master antenna. But Bill, if if we, I started out uh, asking about this a panel antenna. If I, if I use the word a cavity backed radiator, is that the same thing as a panel antenna? Panel antennas have a lot of different uh, uh, configurations. When we talk about a cavity backed radiator. That typically is an iris basket, I'm saying, and uh, those were very popular. If you remember the old Harris cavity-backed radiator, there it's a round basket. Usually mm. the element would sit inside the basket. The uh -huh. benefit of that, uh, Kurt? Yeah. Uh, the benefit of that is uh, you get good isolation. In other words, the, the, you don't get a lot of cross-coupling, mutual coupling between the elements. Uh, the disadvantage is the basket does distort the horizontal plane pattern. And so generally, we've gone to a flat screen architecture uh, and then use wings to provide uh, uh, protection for mutual coupling. We just get a lot better pattern circularity that way. Hey, Burke put up a, a picture there briefly of, uh, of uh, some of the Empire State Building. Um, and, oh, that's an interesting picture. That's an interesting camera lens right there. Uh, so we're looking at, is, is this Empire State we're looking at right here? Yes, that's the Empire State building. Uh, the uh, gray antennas there are a couple of uh, ERI UHF television antennas for DTV. This is kind of an old picture, I think. Yes, it mm. is. It's a relatively old picture because you can still see the uh, old VHF batwing antenna at the very top. At the top, yeah. Sure, sure. That's hey, hey Burke, Burke, you had a picture up there previously. Maybe you could uh, put that one on the one that also included uh, an, an aircraft in, in the picture. That one, uh, I think, showed quite a bit of, of interesting antennas on it, if, uh, if it's possible to find that one again. Um, um, what the heck was I going to – was I going to – oh, yeah. yeah. So we've talked about these, these panel antennas, which typically are fewer bays, I suppose. But for each bay, you've actually got you know, either three or, or perhaps four – uh, panels around the outside of, of a tower. Or a pole. We'll uh, or do a, pole. a top mount. Yeah. And we'll do a top mount pole. Uh, the Senior Road, uh, uh, we've got another one uh, exactly like that one in Oklahoma City. Uh, you end up with three elements scattered around a 20-inch in diameter pipe. Uh, there are wings on that pipe that provide isolation and pattern shaping uh, between the elements. And those are stacked, uh, in the case of both those facilities, you've got 12 bays. Oh. So you're actually indexing about 124 feet from the base flange to the top. So uh, here we have the, while, while we have this picture on, hey, uh, Burke, yeah, there we go. So oh, um, yeah, this, in the, in the kind of near the, near the upper right, uh, you know, below that ice bridge that goes all the way around, there are some, um, some panel antennas, there's some ERIs there. They look like they look like the 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 X or the crosses that are then bent back upon themselves, right there. Right, that's uh, an 1180 series, and the, that is uh, actually uh, right under the ice uh, the uh, ice shield or ice shield. Uh, yeah. The top two bays there are the original uh, master FM antenna that went up uh, was completed in '93, mm -hmm. and the one below that is what we the third element there is actually a separate antenna and that's what we call the mini master chris tobin when you were at cbs radio uh until recently what uh, were you involved with doing anything with those transmitters that fed those antennas 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I worked in the, uh, I helped, did some stuff on the overnights in the combiner room, that a very affectionate room that all of us enjoy. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, up at the ice shield and uh, at the base and uh, the, oh uh, yeah, I did, we had what, we had uh, one, two, three, three FMs up there that I maintain at, at CBS. And then over the years, back in 1993, I was also working with some stations there when they were putting up the new uh, master antenna system. So we were on the Alfred which was the original master antenna. Uh, it's a two-bay. There were little T's. If you're ever up on the Empire State Building, go to the observation deck, look for the little T's that are at a 90-degree angle, 45-degree uh, angle. 45. Uh, off the top of the building. And those that's the Alfred antenna. Actually, you, you can a, see them in, in that picture, yes. uh, Burke. If you, if you scroll to the lower left end of, of that photo of the, of the tower at Empire, scroll as far as you can down and to the left toward the, the bigger base of that of that tower, you'll you'll see them. Hey, Chris, while Burke is uh, finding that, um, let me ask you, Chris, what what kind of um, of power would you need to put out of your transmitters, your FM transmitters, uh, in order to get the right amount of ERP, effective radiated power, uh, coming out of those panel antennas? Uh, well, with, given the length of the cable, the height of the building, height above terrain and everything else, uh, everybody is averaging about, uh, if memory serves me right, 8,000 watts, I think, 8,500 watts. It depends on where you are on the uh, transmission lines and losses okay. in the uh, diplexer and stuff. But that's about it, yeah. Okay, so so <clears> not <throat> not superpower transmitters, but they got to be oh, super no. reliable transmitters, huh? Uh, yes, yeah. Do you definitely want reliable, clean, and, you know, you remember you're you're on a shared network. Think of it that way. It's, a, it's an yeah. RF network. You're, so <laughs> yeah. if you're a dirty neighbor, you're going you're, <laughs> you're to get a lot of people knocking on your door to transmit a room. Back, uh, back to the picture now, and I'm sorry, we'll, we'll hit that Alfred an antenna now. So that's a fascinating thing. Okay, y you see in the fat part uh, there, ringing around the uh, the fatter part of this of this tower, you see these these T's that come out. They, they look well, they look like two L's that are upside down L's that are back to back right there. That there are two levels of that. That's the old Alfred antenna, and it was a special design, I guess, just for this building, and it had a number of FMs, you know, into it. Uh, these things were at 45 degree uh, angles to either the vertical or the horizontal, and two rings of them that went uh, that go around it. They, they, and the antenna is still there. I guess it's not being used. Is it a backup? Uh, it, it's actually, it's actually, uh, yeah, it can be used as a backup. Uh, I think we still have the broadband input still it's still set up to operate. <clears throat> huh. But uh, yeah, it's there because the Empire State Building is a landmark building. You can't take them down. Uh, that, oh, they, they have okay. to stay there. Uh, One more yeah, thing they're, from they're that there for an emergency. Burke, one more thing from that picture, if you want to zoom out of it just a bit. You can see a single rototiller bay. This is the famous uh, ERI design. If uh, if Burke could put that picture back up. I'm sorry we keep asking for it, Burke. Um, there's a, there was, I saw, at least in, in, uh, in profile there, a single ERI uh, bay. You know, lower left, right above the R in Radio Tech there, Burke. There is yeah, a single ERI on. bay. That should, be, that should be gone by now. I think that was KISS FM's backup way Way back, a long time ago. Ah, okay. So just a single uh, backup bay, huh? Yeah, that 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 bay. It's that was either Kiss FM or it may have been WNEW. Uh, that that goes back a long ways. Uh, that was uh, the back of their backup in the event the Alfred system failed. Oh. Um, it, that's how they would stay on the air from there. Paid wow. a dear price to have that little guy sticking out there, but uh, it, it paid, <laughs> it paid for itself. <laughs> well, when you kiss FM, you got to have a little backup, I suppose. But yeah, it, it was one of, one of the one of the guys. Uh, we had, there were a couple up there over the years, but uh, with the new master antenna, mini master, and the alpha backup and the reliability. And then since the events over the years, a lot of broadcasts have moved to off-site backups. Sure. So sure. You know, years ago, it was not uncommon to have a single stick tower that you had two sets of antennas. Uh, one was your primary at the very top or the, at the license height. And then usually a secondary antenna lower down just in the event you have to do maintenance or there was a problem with the primary systems. Um, over the years, people have realized that's all well and good, except what if and blah, blah, blah. So now it's everyone's off site, you know, buildings down in else, other parts of Times Square, uh, across the river in New Jersey or across the river in Queens or, uh, or the Bronx. So that's how people operate with their backups. Folks, you are watching or listening to This Week in Radio Tech. It's our 129th episode. I'm Kirk Harnack, along with Chris Tarr in McWanago, Wisconsin, Chris Tobin in Manhattan, New York, and Bill Harland, who is our guest from ERI. Our show will continue in just a minute, and Bill is going to get around to telling us uh, about this incredible combiner system to combine an FM and an HD, which are 
just right surrounded around the same center frequency uh, into a, a single coaxial antenna. It's just a, an amazing technology and a real boon for FM broadcasters. But first, I want to at least mention and tell you about our dear sponsor for this show that helps make it possible. And that is uh, my, my friends at Axia. At axiaaudio.com on the web. One of the, uh, the runaway hit uh, things that Axia has, has built is this IQ audio console. Now, this is a live wire enabled uh, digital audio console. And the, the Axia Audio IQ is, is, is somewhat modular uh, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of, of panels. The basic console comes with eight faders and all the meters that you want, and a countdown timer and a real-time clock. Uh, that's the IQ console. And on the back of, uh, there, there we go. There's the, uh, uh, if you're watching, there you can see the, the main part of the IQ. By the way, you can take the side, the side panels off and you can butt several of uh, these panels together, these expansion modules, uh, and have a bigger console. Uh, there's, uh, uh, we'll, sp we'll speak about the surfaces. Hopefully Kirk will come back shortly and finish his little repertoire. Yeah, I got to call him back here. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> um, well, I will say um, I have a, a quick story for, for an ERI antenna. And uh, many, many years ago working on FMX system, I think I mentioned this on many episodes in the past, uh, worked with a consultant who uh, came out to... Uh, Work with us. It was folks from uh, FMX, the Brown Brown and Associates out of Detroit, I believe it was. And uh, our facility was uh, Class A. We had a rototilla, a single bay. We believed in just doing a single bay and putting out as much RF as we could. And it helped and worked very well for us. So, uh, you know, midnight, we're out there, and the consultant pulls up in his car, former uh, Camden, New Jersey RCA engineer of the day and a former military RF guy, comes out, looks at it, Says, oh, all right, I see what you got. Takes out a napkin, scribbles a little bit of information, a couple of group delay numbers, and says, here's what we're going to expect for bandwidth of that guy. And what's your frequency? 96.7, okay. We'll be plus or minus number of kilohertz. I think this is where we'll land. And then goes inside, and you know, we had a continental electronics transmitter. And he looks at that, he goes, oh, I know what the group delay will be with through that. Here's a number, put on the napkin. He hands, it, hands me the napkin, says, all right, kid. You know, I was young at the time. <laughs> put this in your uh, pocket, and when we're done the measurements with the HP analyzer, let's pull it out and compare notes. And I kid you not, the, <laughs> the numbers were spot on. He, and he said to me, he goes, look, these two products, you know where they stand. He goes, never an issue. Anybody tells you otherwise, they don't know anything about RF. So I just want to put that out there. All my years working transmitters, antenna systems, working with folks, I have to say every ERI installation has always been what the paperwork says i, I it's just absolutely amazing I, I just had to put that out there i i've heard that too hey thanks for filling in while my connection dropped everybody i i, I really need to finish up the ad because uh the folks at ad axia are uh, are paying for it i appreciate that very much so look at the different expansion modules you can get for the iq console eight faders or you can get six faders and some button strips to define to do what you want to do uh you can also get uh, six faders and a telco module which will control uh a couple of different uh, uh phone systems from telos the iq6 for example or or the new VX uh, voice over IP system. Um, so you can exp expand this console out. You can also rack mount this console. Each uh, expansion module and the main system are rack mountable. They're 19 inches wide and they even include the rack ears. You just unscrew them and flip them up and put it in the rack. And then there is the core. That is the part that goes in the rack that has all the uh, the audio ins and outs, uh, built-in Ethernet switch. So you don't have to worry about buying a third-party Ethernet switch and getting it programmed correctly. You can use the Ethernet switch that's built right into the, uh, the, the core, either the core 16 or core 32 portion of the console. And there's a backup power supply. You want redundant power? No problem. Just get the backup supply and, and stick that right in there. Uh, mic inputs, analog inputs, AES inputs, uh, analog and AES outputs as well, and plus GPIO. It's all built into the to the uh, IQ console. Check out your favorite uh, dealer uh, in the U.S. Uh, the Axial line is represented by uh, Broadcasters General Store, and uh, we have dealers all over the world, uh, plus a number of uh, of uh, installers, um, folks who do system integration. will be happy to uh, acquire and install for you an Axia system. On the web, axiaaudio.com slash IQ. These things are really cool. 
Oh, and we got some new consoles, too. We'll tell you about those another time. There's the rack and the desk console, little six-figure consoles. All right. Thanks very much, uh, Axia, for uh, sponsoring uh, this episode of This Week in Radio Tech. All right, Bill Harlan, in our time remaining, about uh, 10 or 12, maybe 15 minutes, let's talk about this thing that you showed me at the NAB show. Uh, broadcasters who want to who add HD uh, have a few options for combining the RF output from their HD transmitter along with their FM transmitter. They can do what we call high-level combining, which is when you just, you know, you're shoving these two signals together into the same piece of coax and using a common antenna to transmit both. That's one way to do it. Another way is you can have a separate antenna on the tower uh, to transmit one signal, say the HD signal, so you add a second antenna. Uh, another way is to buy a new transmitter that can actually amplify both signals, the FM and the HD. Um, most popular way, I, I think the most popular way, has been this high-level combining despite the terrible drawback that it's had, and that is that you waste a ton of power from the HD transmitter. Bill, I'll shut up now and you tell me about this, uh, this combiner. It's amazing. So you've been looking for the holy grail. I, to, as, as you mentioned earlier, the problem with uh, combining analog and HD is you've got uh, two signals that are right adjacent to one another. So if you're going to combine two signals that are very, very close in frequency, you can only do that with very, very high insertion loss. Uh, can we bring up that, uh, the catalog photo slide, uh, Burke? And uh, so at this year's NAB, uh, we were uh, very fortunate. We've been working on this for about three years. We've got the model 788 uh, all-pass diplexer. Uh, this is uh, a production unit. What you're seeing there in the picture is an actual installation uh, at uh, a diplexed uh, system that's used by uh, – that's uh, owned by Hubbard Broadcasting in St. Louis, WYLFM and uh, hmm. WXOS, if uh, memory serves. Uh, we move to the next slide when you have a chance. This is a very low insertion loss. And as you mentioned, Kirk, with a 10 dB hybrid, you waste 90% of the digital power into a dummy load. Yeah. And uh, you uh, waste 10% uh, of the uh, analog power. Okay. This allows you, it uses a, a phase shifting technology rather than a band pass technology so, the, so that what you end up with is instead of losing 10% of the analog power, you only lose 8%. You get 92% of the analog power, leaves this uh, all-pass diplexer and starts up the transmission line to your antenna. Okay. Now, the digital... With a 10 dB hybrid, you end up with a 90% a loss. Well, with this, you will end up with less than 30%. So 72% of your digital power goes up the transmission line, starts up the transmission line to the antenna. So this, this is a, a situation where if, you've, if you're on the air now and you're running t minus 20 dB CI buck or 1%, yeah. You can take out your 10 dB hybrid, you can put this diplexer in, and you can get to just short of 11 dB down. You can certainly get to the 14 dB uh, that the FCC lets you turn up to without any additional authorization, without uh -huh. buying either a new analog or digital transmitter. So uh, it's uh, – and uh, the what you pay for this is uh, – besides the losses is the group delay is a little higher than uh, – than is ideal, but it uh, in the case of the digital, it meets the ubiquity specification, mm -hmm. and uh, in the case of the analog, it's highly correctable. Gotcha. Okay. All right. And this is not a science project. There, as I mentioned, the Hubbard's got two of them on the air. This is a production unit. One of the pictures, I think it was the last link that you sent me, was a uh, a diagram. And maybe if, if Burke could uh, get that yeah. diagram, I'd like to un understand a bit about what's going on. What are the different components here? I see four big cavities in the back, and those are a pretty classic uh, cavity, uh, you know, a uh, uh, bandpass those, uh, type design. Well, those are actually notch filters. And, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. The reason we came, we were able to do this is that is what a, are, are a pair of what uh, we use at high level for group delay compensation. When you have closely spaced uh, channels on an FM combiner, you end up with the excessive group delay. And what these modules do is since the group delay is fixed and doesn't change, 
-hmm. we can introduce group delay in the opposite direction so it cancels out through the system. Well, so we've always looked at these in terms of of the time domain. Well, the other thing you can do with these is uh, if you set them up so that in a group delay mode, you you offset tune each pair. In other words, each notch is set slightly apart in frequency. Mm -hmm. In this application, we make them absolutely identical uh, in terms of notch depth and, and phase. And so essentially what's going on is each one of the I-box side, sidebands is going through a 180-degree phase shift. And that's how we're getting the isolation between analog and digital. The digital, each, the, uh, each set of cans there, one deals with the upper sideband, one deals with the lower digital sideband. And uh, the analog sees virtually no phase shift. And so that's how we achieve the 40 dB isolation between analog and digital. And, and just and to point out for uh, just to point out for our, our audience, you, when you take two transmitters, you, you can't just take their outputs and, and, and shove them together. I mean, if, if, if you want to put it in terms uh, uh, here, I'll just use this example. You, you, a, a lot of folks you know, know what a CB radio is. Well, you can't if, if you have two CB radios and one CB radio antenna. You can't just take the outputs of the two CB radios and, and you know, uh, twist them together or use a T connector and then shove that up to the antenna. No, that that's terrible. Uh, one will end up blowing up the other. Uh, and it'll just be awful. You have to isolate these electrically from each other, even if they're both going to the same antenna. And you do that with a, a system like what you're showing here that electrically isolates these from each other so that one transmitter, I use the case of a CB radio, but let's say an FM transmitter, it thinks that it's the only guy there, you know, uh, and the other transmitter, let's say the HD transmitter in this case, thinks that it's the only guy there and neither one of them knows about the other or it's, you know, 40 dB down, as you said, which is a good, a good quite a bit of isolation. Uh, Bill, I'm, I'm interested in knowing, uh, looking at the ports here, okay, I see three available ports in the example picture shown here they look like three and an eighth inch uh, eia flanges um what yeah. is each port on this all right uh, here in the slide on the right uh you've got uh, the analog input and digital inputs uh, are shared on that hybrid okay and uh the high these are each one of these round uh uh four port tanks is a is a 3db <laughs> hybrid okay and then right. uh the other open port is where the combined analog and digital signals appear. Okay, so the port on the left, the one that's and open, then, that's uh, where the – that goes to the antenna, yeah? That, that goes to the antenna. That's where your transmission line would hook up. And uh, the reject load there is uh, rated for about 2.5 kilowatts and under operation it sees typically less than a kilowatt. Yeah, so that thing in the in the lower left is is a reject load. Some folks call it a dummy load or a dry load, and it's hooked up to one of those hybrids you can see on the on the left hand side. So that is that's the energy that that um, you know couldn't couldn't make it out anywhere else. Uh, that's the energy that 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 be due to imperfections in the mechanical design of what we have to deal with in the real world that catches the slop the overflow the the energy that that it just couldn't squeeze into the uh, antenna because nothing is a, is a perfect system here now in in previous systems though with a 10 db combiner or an injector that dummy load had to be much bigger oftentimes they were air cooled and they were blowing thousands of watts of heat out of them in this case you've got a a, a, a lot less heat being wasted in that dummy load by a, a huge factor. Well, and let's not forget the digital power costs a lot more to make than analog power. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, hey, throwing uh, away Bill, um, of your, yeah. So some folks in the chat room were wondering, and maybe you could provide a good explanation. Tell us about group delay. What does that mean in an antenna system? And and I don't know, and maybe Chris Tobin or Chris Tarr would like to add to your answer, but help us understand about group delay. What what group delay is all about is as as you move away from the center frequency, even in a, a power amplifier, in a transmitter, or in a bandpass filter, or in a combiner, uh, the elements of the signal actually move slower through that filter system the farther away you get from center frequency. Mm. And uh, some work we did at Broadcast Electronics when uh, Jeff Mendenhall was the vice president of engineering there back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. did some studies to look at group delay. And uh, 
he improved uh, mathematically and then later in field tests that uh, if you want the absolute best stereo separation, if you want the lowest harmonic distortion, if you want the least amount of noise in the received decoded signal, then what you want to do is you want to make sure that all the components of that composite FM signal arrive at the front end of that receiver as close as pos to the same time as possible. Yeah. And uh, uh, what we do with group delay correction, and, and there's no specification on analog group delay, uh, what we would like to see. Ideally, you would like to see 50 nanoseconds or less, 75 nanoseconds. Or less in a practical, re in practical terms, uh, I'm not aware of any measurements that have showed a reduction in uh, received audio performance uh, at uh, uh, group delay uh, differences of less than 150 nanoseconds. Don't, uh, many people could argue with me about that. That's just uh, what what uh, research I'm aware of. So you can correct that, as I mentioned, by using a fixed high-level device. We, uh, we and other companies also make a device that goes between the exciter and the IPA. Uh, mm -hmm. That uh, essentially all you're doing is just uh, adding reverse group delay, and when it goes through the filter that's causing it, it just all cancels out and becomes zero on the other end. You know, maybe this is a good way to think about it, maybe not. I like to think of, of excessive group delay as being, it's likened to distortion, but not in the in the amplitude domain, but in the time domain. You're actually distorting time uh, the farther you get away from the center carrier, and so that's that's what group delay is. It's it's a nonlinearity in terms of time of the signal progressing through a system. And and as you as you said, uh, uh, Jeff Mendenhall um, uh, showed that, that you want to minimize this group delay. You want the stereo uh, signal to arrive intact and all in time at the receiver, and you'll get the best stereo separation and the least amount of you know recovered distortion and so forth. Um, Absolutely. Wow. Uh, Chris Tobin, is there anything you can add to that about group delay? I've, we've, you know, it's, it's, it's an odd subject to think about uh, time-based distortion. Um, not too much. I mean, I, he's right about the, the nanos that was 150 nanoseconds or more. Uh, I remember we did the testing years ago with some stuff uh, with the FMX to refer to that. Um, group delay was a big to-do. Everything coming to the uh, receiver timed was important. Uh, again, I think that's one of those areas where unless you do a lot of, a lot of research... It's hard to say how much it impacts. And in today's world, all the digital stuff, it's probably something still to be considered. Because I know in the DTV, uh, the digital television folks, they have to be real careful. I mean, even analog TV was had issues with group delay. But now even more so with the digital stuff. I was talking to someone recently, and they, were, they, were, they just pull their hair out when they find issues with any delay within the RF chain and the system. And, and um, it manifests itself into interesting artifacts in the digital world. So I'm uh. sure... Yeah, I'm sure the FM radio uh, between analog and, and IBOC and everything else, I'm sure group delay has an effect. But I think with today's transmit as being so linear, uh, so much is given to making sure everything is close. You know, it's probably, you know, one of those things, unless somebody really sits down and dissects it, we probably will never know, you know, <laughs> where the threshold is. Bill, we are just about out of time. Uh, I want to uh, uh, I want to hit up uh, Chris Tobin and Chris Tarr before we go with with any last bit of questions. I just want to see Bill if you would comment on one more thing. I mentioned earlier in the show about the the beautiful manufacturing uh, when you make like the rototiller antennas. That's what I'm most familiar with. Um, a, a lot of uh, manufacturers put put external adjustments on their antennas to uh, you know to fine tune them in the field and ERI doesn't have this, at least on the outside. You can fine-tune some slugs on the matching section on the input of an antenna. Um, tell me just a little bit about ERI's philosophy in building antennas. What, you know, what makes ERI ERI in terms of what comes out the door mechanically as an antenna? Well, really what we're about is we don't want external feed points. Our feed point is internal. It's pressurized. It's welded. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't use adjustable fine matchers. Uh, and, and we make them, but uh, in general, uh, we use, a, as you mentioned, a slug-tuned matching section. And we do that because you only need to match the antenna once when you put it up. And uh, the advantage of the slug is it tends to the slugs tend to be broadband devices. Fine matchers tend to be narrow band, and uh, the uh, 
Other thing is when you're sticking probes in through an outer conductor towards an inner conductor, you're reducing the peak voltage handling uh, capability of that. When you use a steatite slug, you're not. And uh, yeah. so we, we believe that uh, you should uh, put up an antenna once, slug it once, and not worry about it. Uh, we just replaced one here uh, today, left uh, replacing a 33-year-old four-bay rototiller that had never had a service call. Wow, 34 years old, and it just stays there and runs. That's pretty amazing, but not exactly unexpected, I suppose. We try. <laughs> hey, uh, Chris Tarr, if you're still with oh, good, he's still with us. I thought Chris might have to leave during the show. Chris, you got any last-minute questions for Bill Harland at ERI? No, other than I, I'm real excited to hear about this uh, this new combiner. I am one of the ones, since I we went to uh, HD in 04, 05, at that time, that's all you could do at my power level was high-level combining. So I have one of those old, wasteful, uh, uh, high-level combiners, uh, the the injectors. So uh, we are one that we, you know, and when, when the FCC came out with the, the 14 dB increase to minus 14 dB, we couldn't get there because I didn't buy a transmitter big enough. I mean, I have a 3,000-watt digital transmitter, but by the time we get up to the the, uh, the antenna, it's 300 watts after combining. So this is a real good solution for those of us who have spent the money on the infrastructure that's only a few years old and really can't afford to replace. I mean, I'd, be, I'd have to replace a transmitter and a, and a bunch of other things. This sounds like a real, uh, uh, a real nice way to uh, upgrade that without having to spend a whole lot of money. Chris Tobin, any last-minute uh, comments from you? Oh, last thing I would say is just uh, check your line pressure, make sure everything's in order, and uh, make sure your visoire hasn't changed with the weather uh, shifting. That's always really good advice. <laughs> hey, Bill, um, I'm afraid we're about out of time, but if you've got any last-minute things you want to get in, now's the time to do it. It's been great hanging out with you guys for the last hour. I've enjoyed it very much. Hope to do it again sometime. All right. And if folks want to reach you, they can at uh, on the web at www.eriinc.com. Dot com that put by the way that does put two eyes in a row so you're not looking at a funny e r i i n c uh, and Bill I guess they can ask for you personally they can ask for me or <laughs> just ask for sales everybody's been uh, shown all the ropes on this uh, okay well good deal well thanks very much uh, to Chris Tobin in uh, Manhattan New York the best dressed engineer in radio appreciate you being here Chris Tobin oh you're welcome anytime I had a great I, I enjoy this this is good R F is fun black magic but it's fun. And Chris Tarr, the man who will one day show me all the secrets of geocaching. Chris Tarr from Muckwine, Wisconsin. <laughs> that, that Absolutely. Well, I've, I'm, I'm up to, uh, I think, 115 now that, after this past weekend. So I will absolutely show you how it all works. 115 geocaches? Yeah, yeah. We, wow. uh, we, went out, we, we knocked out seven. I think this weekend, Nathan and I are going to go for 10. So we're hoping have, to break 200 this year. Have you ever put any, any caches in place or are you just finding them? I do. I actually have one called Tower Farming, which is located near a tower farm. <laughs> okay. All righty. Well, I know there's plenty of caches around my neighborhood. I've just got to get out and, and play that game. I think when my little son grows up a little bit, we'll do more of that. I tell All you, right, what, that'll, be, yeah. that'll be perfect. You'll love it. I think you will. I've done a little bit of it myself, and I, I know the, the thrill of, oh, wow, there it is. There it is. It's, it's, it's a great game. Great, ho great hobby. And Bill, uh, Bill Harlan, thanks again for being with us. I sure appreciate you taking uh, an hour and a half out of your evening to, uh, to be with us and all the people listening and watching. Thank you very much. All right. And thanks to Burke at the uh, Twit Network for switching and taking care of us uh, in terms of production duties. Appreciate you very much, Burke. Our show, show number 129 here, has been brought to you by Axia Audio and the IQ Audio Console on the web at axiaaudio.com slash iq next week we've got a war stories episode you won't want to miss it we've got quite an, a thrilling tale uh prompted by hurricane irene not something that you'd want to go through but they did and we'll have the stories about it coming up next week uh, we'll see you next week on this week in radio tech bye-bye everybody